served in churches. He is presently serving as FIM, and he'll explain some of that to you, but uh, serving with FIM uh, as their director, and uh, he's coming at this time and sharing with the Lord's laid upon his heart. I do that all the time. Yeah. Being with you, and uh, it really is a privilege to be here. Uh, I was here five years ago for a missions conference, and and loved it. And the church has grown since that time, and uh, there is just such a sweet spirit here. And uh, I'm just so thankful for you as a church. I'm so thankful for your partnership with uh, Jeff and Phoebe Welch. Uh, they're missionaries with Fellowship International Mission, and uh, so we're super thankful for them and for their. Uh, for their ministry, for what they're doing, uh, and uh, just uh, they're, they're, they're an exciting couple, and Jeff is uh, uh, really, uh, let's see, am I, let's see if I've got that, oh, it's not on, okay, on the side, switch, let's see if that works, oh, okay, it says, oh, and, uh, all right, uh, very, very complicated here, there we go, yeah, that's all right, so, um, so Jeff and Phoebe are missionaries serving the Lord, serving the Lord in Germany, and right now they live in Portugal, uh, but they uh, need to raise additional support to get from Portugal to Germany because of the higher cost of living. And so I just want to thank you as a church uh, for joining with them in ministry. It is a, a real privilege. Uh, Jeff is a vibrant evangelist. I mean, he's just been, you know, you think I'm big I, and Pastor Rand, I mean, this Jeff's a big dude. Uh, but he is a gentle giant, and he does. Uh, he goes out in the streets. He talks to people. Uh, sometimes using a sketchboard. Sometimes just talking to folks. Uh, he and, and when you're with Jeff, you will be really blessed and encouraged uh, to share your faith as well. So we're going to love Jeff next year with you next week, and just thank you so much for uh, joining with him. Uh, F I M, and I guess I'm not. Am I on or? Am I on this one? Let's see. Am I on this one? Yeah, let's see. Oh, okay. I pulled it off. Well, I'll just stand close to the microphone. There we go. Okay. You know, I need I need a 12-year-old to tell, tell me how to figure this stuff out. You know, kids are great with electronics, aren't they? They all they like it just intuitively. I have a a one-year-old granddaughter. She picks up, you know, a book and she's doing this. Like, you know, say no, no, it's not a phone, it's a it's a book, crazy, right? Um, so uh, FIM, uh, privileged to be serving the Lord as a mission agency since 1950. That's when we started uh, with a missionary, a, a single woman by the name of Mary Mellinger that felt God's call to go to Morocco. It was uh, 1945, and uh, there was a war going on, and she went. No mission agency would take her. Uh, but she went, and because she was single, and she's a woman, and there's a war, and... Morocco's French, Muslim, and uh, she went, uh, joined with another woman and uh, the, uh, another missionary who had been there. Uh, they were there without any mission agency, but they wrote their pastors. Uh, the pastor was uh, Ralph Boyer from York Gospel Center, and uh, they said, we, we know that God wants us here, but we need, we need help. We need somebody to support us in the U.S., and those pastors got together from some churches in Central PA, and they formed what today is Fellowship International Mission. We have 140 missionaries in 30 countries. Pastor Randy, we have our strongest intake of new missionaries that we've ever had. Uh, it is so exciting. And, and you know what, several, and, and they're, they're young and old. I've got, uh, there's, a, there's a 64-year-old woman who's going to the Ukraine to minister to the grandmas who are in Ukraine and they're too old to, they haven't left, they're still there, but they need help and she's bringing food and, and uh, helping them in so many ways and sharing the gospel. And then there's young couples, young kids in Bible colleges, and whether they're young or old, here's what they're saying, we don't have much time left before Jesus comes Amen. and we want to share the gospel. Isn't that awesome? Um, uh, Isaac, one of our mobilizers, was at Liberty University last week. Uh, normally, when we go to Liberty University, we have anywhere from 20 to 30 um, you know, students that sign up and want to get started on the path to being missionaries. 
96 kids. That, that's just that's just that by him. That's just that, that's like just taking our little agency because there's some agencies that Samaritan's Purse is there and larger agencies. FIM is not a super large agency, uh, but um, that is an indication. The hearts of young people. Uh, there there are young people who are living for Lord. I there's a revival going on in college campuses right now. It's exciting. God is stirring the hearts. I, I pray this is like the, the last thrust of the gospel before Jesus comes. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Do you want to be part of it? Yeah. Yeah. I do. I do. Let's talk about that a little bit. The priority at FIM is the gospel. Uh, those 140 missionaries are doing all kinds of things, but all of them, whether they're helping with water, um, you know, uh, water provision or, or food or medical or school teachers or uh, authors. We've got all kind of very, very broad agency because we're just helping missionaries to fulfill their call. But they're all involved in sharing the gospel in one form. And if I am, we're not concerned with our goals and the places that we would like to see missionaries involved in. And we talk to people that want to be missionaries and we ask the question, what has God called you to do? And we come alongside and help you fulfill God's calling in your life. We want to see you thrive in your ministry. We're going to help you with communicating with your home church and your supporters and, and raising up a good support network. Your supporters and the people that are praying for you and the people that are giving to you, they're an essential part of your ministry. You couldn't be there without them. And God puts this wonderful team together so that you're not serving the Lord alone. If God is calling you into thinking about serving the Lord in missions, we want to help. We want to be part of that team of you and your local church and your support partners that work together to accomplish the Great Commission. And that's a great picture, isn't it? You, as a missionary, so if God's calling you to be a missionary, we need to talk today. Like, don't wait till I leave. Let's talk today. If, if God's burdening your heart about being a missionary and you can't be too old, uh, we had a missionary in Mexico by the name of Mark Landis. He passed away. He was working full time until he developed uh, uh, cancer, I think it was pancreatic cancer. He developed cancer, he was sick, he was in and out of the hospital a little bit, but, but pretty much serving the Lord up until two weeks before he died, full time at the age of 92. Wow, isn't that awesome? <laughs> and so, look, you know, if God is calling you, don't, don't say no to the Holy Spirit. Don't put all these like, well, I can't because, I'm not trying to, we can figure that out. If God's called you, let's talk. But there's three parts. There's the missionary who's called. There's the local church, and that's us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, just before I get to the message, while I'm sharing this, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And then I'll just talk about these books that I shared in Sunday school. Uh, the main one is this larger book. There's two. The bigger one is a Bible study curriculum to help you know the Word of God. 36 lessons that are really from my ministry at Faith Bible Church in Vineland. That's where I was before serving as the director of FIM. 36 lessons on four topics. Uh, the lessons are either about the Bible doctrine, there it's lessons how to study the Bible, it's lessons on Christian living, things like why should I be baptized, how do I give, where do I serve, what are my spiritual gifts, and there's lessons on current, even current cultural issues like marriage, um, racism, um, uh, uh, abortion, sanct the sanctity of life. And, and they just take you through a Bible study. You can do it by yourself or with a small group or with friends. And pastor, there's a Spanish, I have, this is in six languages, but we're producing a Spanish version within, the, it's, it's in the works right now. So that might be a good resource for you. The smaller book is a theology of how Jesus led his disciples. What did he do when he discipled them? Three and a half years, what can we learn from the methods of Jesus in discipleship? So those are there, uh, cash, uh, check, or even credit card if you don't have your uh, enough cash or, or something like that. And if you don't, then Pastor Randy said he'd pay for it. Uh, so um, just uh, see him after. No, he didn't say that. Uh, but uh, just to make sure you have that today if you'd like that. So the, the theme of this conference, who, who can tell me what the missions conference theme is without looking at your bulletin? I know you know. 
Why the missions? Isn't that a great question? Why? Look, we put a lot of effort into this, don't we? I mean, we have a missions conference. We have missionary speakers. We give some of, some of the support from our church, right? There's, there's church support, but there's mission support. Uh, we have mission agencies like FIM and many, many others. This is a big task. Uh, at Liber we're at Liberty University. They take a whole week and all of the, there's mission representatives in all of the classes and it's a big effort. Why missions? Why missions? Our son Michael was six years old. He was at a Christian school and he returned home one day, got home and uh, Kim, my wife Kim brought him home and was sitting there we're kind of rehearsing the day and you know what happened and uh, we, our Bible lesson today was about hell. And mommy, I never knew about that. And it is just so sad. But at least they burn up and then they don't have to suffer anymore. And Kim said, no, Michael. The fire in hell never goes out. And his little six-year-old eyes got big. And he said, what are we going to do? That's sweet, isn't it? But isn't that the right response? What are we going to do? There's a reality, and, and I know this, this week has been filled with grief, uh, with sadness, with concern, um, just human suffering on a massive scale. Uh, another war in the Middle East. Um, my, my son is active duty Maryland National Guard. That, that boy, that six-year-old boy, is a captain in the Army uh, serving in Maryland. Um, uh, will he be called up? I, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem like the Army's going to be much involved at this point. But look, it's a concern, right? Right? It's a concern. And all of our hearts have been heavy. And I don't want to be a Debbie Downer this morning, but there is a biblical truth that we often don't talk about. And, and why don't we talk about it? Because it's, it's sad. It's uncomfortable. Um, it's a difficult doctrine. Folks, I would, I would prefer... I'm not God. Please don't misunderstand. In my human part of me, I mean, I, I, remember what the Apostle Paul said? I would give my life and suffer forever so that my people would be saved. The nation of Israel. I, I, can, I can relate to that. Um, the, the thought of hell is not an easy subject to think about. It's not pleasant dinnertime conversations. It, it's not professional baseball and, I don't know, who's, who's playing? Braves and... I, I don't know. You can tell how much I follow sports. I don't, I don't have time for it, but it, you know, it's, it's not conversation about the weather or the recipe that you had last night. It is an awful truth. But, I, but here's the problem. We sometimes focus on the word awful and we miss the word truth. It is truth. It is truth. <coughs> there is a destiny awaiting those who reject Jesus Christ, and that destiny is eternal punishment in the lake of fire. That is a hard truth. Last Sunday, Pastor Russ made this statement, preaching on the Great Commission. Awesome sermon, brother. Um, and he said this, every human being needs to hear the gospel. Now, I believe that, and I know you believe that. And, and he was sharing that from the Great Commission where Jesus gives the disciples, and by extension, us. By the way, every one of us, the Great Commission is not a missionary. It's not just for the missionaries. It's all of us, right? We believe in the faith once delivered by the apostles. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, then think about his followers. What did he tell his followers? They were the first ones. He gave the message to them, 
and then they went and spread the message to others, right? The apostle, so first, the message was spread in Jerusalem, and the Sunday before, Pastor Randy talked from Acts chapter 1 8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uh, the, and, and then the ends of the earth. So a kind of a spreading, kind of a, an explosion of the gospel, that's exactly the story of the book of Acts. Starting in Jerusalem, led by the apostle Peter, going into Judea and Samaria, Philip and others in Acts chapter 8, Peter in Acts chapter 10, and then from Acts chapter 12 through Acts chapter 28, the Apostle Paul, first with Barnabas, then with Silas, going out and bringing the gospel further, further into the then known world under the Roman authority and bringing the gospel to the ends of the world. And we, if you've believed in Jesus, you believe in their message. And so there is a reality. In fact, the, the slide this morning, the world is perishing. What <coughs> shall we do? Taking off what my little six-year-old said. What are we going to do? And let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And that's the phrase we're going to focus on this morning. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And Father, help us to understand the truths of this passage as it relates to the necessity of missions and as it relates to our responsibilities to share the gospel as good witnesses of the grace that's been given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The word perish, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Time and time again, both in the Gospels and in the Epistles, we find this truth that the world is perishing. Um, my wife knows that I don't like sad movies. Uh, I, you know, like the, uh, remember we watched the Titanic. I was depressed for days. I know it was, you know, ancient history, but, you know, like, oh, man, I just, I just don't like sad movies. I'd rather watch those cheesy you know, hallmark, silly things in a sad movie. But the idea of perishing, isn't that an awful thing? Uh, the, you know, when, when you read stories of, of, of human tragedy and, and, and suffering, it's, it's, just, it's just heartbreaking. But I want you to realize that that is the condition of the world, no matter how <coughs> polished things might look on the outside, no matter how many happy faces and smiling faces we might see, in spite of all of the entertainment and all of the diversions and, and all of the things that people do to kind of gloss over this inner brokenness and this inner emptiness, the world is perishing. Uh, the word is in the middle voice in the Greek. It means that it's perishing of its own choice. It's perishing of its own choice. Uh, people have an opportunity to hear the gospel, and that's really what we want to talk about. That, and again, going back to Pastor Rant, uh, Pastor Russ's statement last Sunday, every human being needs to hear the gospel so that at least they can have the opportunity to be free from their uh, eternal dilemma. The picture there is of Adoniram Judson. He's an important name in missions. He's really the first. U.S. American missionary to go out into the world. But he was the son of a Massachusetts pastor, very bright, smartest in his class. He went to Brown University, Brown, Princeton, uh, not Princeton, um, uh, Providence, uh, Rhode Island, Brown University. I've been on the campus there once when we visited. Uh, today it's a totally secular place, but back then it was an institution, as many of them were, for training up uh, ministers and training people in uh, theology. He went to Brown, and at Brown, he met a friend who claimed to be an atheist. They would get into all of these late-night, you know, uh, dormitory discussions, and, and, and 
This atheist friend knocked down every argument of young Adoniram, and he became so frustrated at the arguments of the atheist, he said, well, I must be an atheist too. He went home and told his parents of this revelation. His father was furious, his mother wept, and with the disappointment from home, he left for fame and pleasure going to New York City. Well, that wore out pretty quickly, and from New York City, he decided he would go out where the action was and live life to his fullest, so he started on a journey out to the American West. On his way out to the West, he stopped for lodging in one city. There was only one room left. He gladly took it. However, there was a man who was dying in the next room. Judson lay awake all night, listening to the shuffling of the doctor's feet and the coughs and the moans of the dying man. In the morning, Judson asked the innkeeper, or I'm sorry, the innkeeper asked Judson how he slept, and he said, well, of course I didn't sleep at all. Who was that young man who was dying last night? And the innkeeper said, well, it was really sad. He was a young man about your age, went to some fancy school out east called Brown, the young man was the atheist friend of Adoniram. It shook Adoniram to his core, and he gave his life to Jesus for the first time. You know, being the son of a Massachusetts pastor was not what saved Adoniram. It was an encounter with Jesus. And for us here today, um, it don't matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter, you know what kind of, how, how devoted your parents were, or if they baptized you when you were a child, what matters if you, is, is whether or not you have accepted Jesus as your Savior. Right. Because if you don't accept Jesus, that eternal destiny of hell awaits you. Back to the story of Adoniram. He was burdened because he realized that there were many, many people, millions of people in India who had not heard the gospel. You see, this was the time of William Carey William Carey was a missionary from England who was going to India, and Adoniram said, I want to do what William Carey is doing. Except there was a little problem going on, and it was called the War of 1812. India, under British control, so this American missionary goes to India, no bueno, for those of you that know Spanish, I think you, Pastor, even know that word, right? That did not work. He got to India. Uh, it was under the control of the East India Trade Company. They kept him from remaining in India. He was persecuted by the English, who were the enemies of America at that time. And so he said, well, I can't go to India, so I'm going to go to Burma. He learned that he went to Burma. Uh, he learned Burmese without the aid of, an, of a dictionary or a grammar. He just listened to words. It took him years. He didn't know anyone who spoke English. He wrote the first dictionary and then the first grammar and translated the Bible into Burmese. But what a, what a difficult task uh, for Adoniram. When Adoniram uh, found his wife, Anne Hasseltine, a uh, girlfriend at the time, he you know, went to her dad and to ask permission. Right? Like, like a good young man should do. Uh, like my son-in-law did. Uh, and uh, I was a little hard on my future side. I want you to know he's my best friend now. Okay? <laughs> yeah. But this is what he said to Anne's father. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter, whether you can consent to her departure in the heathen land, and her subjugation to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary's life whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every king of want, every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Now, how does that sound for a talk with your future father-in-law? Yeah, right. honest. <laughs> uh, they got married. The father-in-law must have been a man of faith, I'll tell you what. They went to India without any intention of returning. As we mentioned, it was the War of 1812. He was captured. He was in prison. In prison. He, he embraced believer's baptism. He was an Anglican, but now he embraced believer's baptism like, like we do here. 
And because of that, he knew that his Congregationalist Mission Board would not, would, they would end their support. He did it anyway. He remained in India after they were ordered to leave. Then he went to Burma. In Burma, previous missionaries had been beaten. Burmese believers had been killed. There was no welcome for him. He worked 15 hours a day for six years before his first convert. Let me say that again. He worked 15 hours a day for six years before anybody got saved. You know what his newsletters must have been like? I mean, you know, no fruit, no fruit, no fruit, no fruit, no fruit, no fruit. Six years. Faithful man. Uh, it took four years before he had a single conversation with anyone about Jesus. He lived in the filth and stench of a tropical swamp city. He lost a child at birth, one at eight months, one, in two, one at two years, and a fourth just six months after the death of his first wife, Anne. He then married Sarah. He and Sarah lost their son, Henry. Sarah died en route back to America, and then their son, Charlie, died in, Bur in Burma. In all, he had lost six children and two wives. He had been abandoned by the Americans, captured by the French, outlawed by the British, and beaten and imprisoned by the Burmese. He returned to America after 30 years in Burma, more Burmese than American. And we look at that as an example of faith. Now I'm glad to tell you that, for the most part, missions does not often look like that. There are times that it does. For the most part, missions does not often look like that. I was just on a tour to Israel. By the way, I returned from Israel three weeks ago yesterday. I was in Israel with a tour, and uh, we could have been stuck like many Americans are st stuck there now. The State Department's trying to get them out. Uh, one of the couples on our tour has a son who's a pilot with MAF, Missionary Aviation Fellowship. I uh, won't tell you the name of the country. I won't give you his name, because, uh, but their son was delivering materials uh, to a group that was out of favor with the government. He was arrested and imprisoned for four months. Uh, the State Department tried to get him out. He, had, he hasn't seen his wife or children in 14 months. They just released him like two weeks ago. Great cost. Great cost. It, was, it totally took him by surprise. Uh, thankfully, he was not abused that we are, are, are aware of, um, but uh, a great cost to him. And why would they do that? Why would Adoniram give his life and, and, and see such great personal cost in his life? Why would this missionary pilot surrender his life and say, Lord, I'm going. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going. And the reason is these men and women understand the need of the world. The world is perishing. What shall we do? Let me give you four things that we try to do instead. One of the things we do is we try to redefine hell. And so uh, we come up with the idea of eternal conscious suffering or some form of universalism such as Rob Bell or Joel Osteen might preach. Or uh, we come up with the annihilation theory, and, and these are, there are theologians, uh, Pastor Randy, Pastor Russ can give you their names and say, well, they actually say, well, my six-year-old son thought, well, they just burn up and that's it, and it's a one-time punishment. But the Bible is very clear. It is an eternal lake that burns with fire. That's right. And we try to redefine hell. You know, most Americans believe in the reality of hell. A Barner Research uh, 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 survey revealed this, that 76% of Americans believe heaven exists. 71% of, American of, of Americans believe hell exists. But guess what? Almost no one believes they're going there. <laughs> Pastor, I've done funerals. Of the worst, down low. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I remember this one funeral I did. And the friends were there. And you know how people, I don't, it's kind of, it's really ignorant. People put things in the cat, you know, like you, you did. Six pack of beer, pack of cigarettes, you know, uh, all kinds of just, you know. But he's with, he's in a better place, right? People that never darkened the door of a church, that never spoke a word about Jesus other than a curse word, they die, and they could die with a needle in their arm, and they're in a better, that's right, am I, is, is that true? Everybody's in a better place. 
Everybody's in a better place. We redefine hell. C.S. Lewis said this, It is proper to wish that all would be saved. I would pay any price to be able to say truthfully, all will be saved. We can't say that truthfully. Because if there was such a thing as universalism, if all roads lead to heaven, then God sent his son to die a cruel death needlessly. The cross is about forgiveness, and it's about redemption. And if there is a uni- if, if all roads lead to heaven, then there was no need for the cross, and God is a cruel heavenly father. The cross was the only way to satisfy the justice of God and the love of God. You know, there's something interesting. It's... It's something about the attributes and the character of God that we sometimes have a hard time connecting with. God's attributes cannot be separated. People want to say things like God is love, and that is true, and praise God for that. I am so glad that God is a God of love. But do not separate God's justice. Because love without justice is evil. I want you to just picture yourself... A crime has been committed against you, right? You've been robbed. You've been cheated. You've been accused. Or or maybe some physical harm has come against you. And and, um, and there is is something that's happening against you. And you're sitting in the courtroom, and the the offender comes in, the person that caused you so much harm, and he stands before the judge, and the judge says, you know what? I'm feeling loving. I know this is what the law says. But I'm a loving judge, and I'm going to release you. Is that, is that justice? That's injustice. That's evil. That's an, we would call that an evil judge, an immoral judge. And God is not such a judge. And so your sin, the sin that you've committed since your childhood, yes, since your childhood, a sin so small as stealing something that wasn't yours, or hurting someone to get your way, or lying about something to to, to manipulate your way out of trouble, or cheating on an exam, or cheating on taxes, or whatever it might be, or even something far more devious and, and dark than that, your sin, your sin put Jesus on the cross. My sin put Jesus on the cross, because only in the cross is the love of God shown and the justice of God satisfied. Amen. You know, there, think about this. Jesus, it, it's not the death of Jesus that saves you. you know, wait a minute, well, where are you going with this, Paul? Jesus could have come to earth, lived a sinless life, and died of old age, and rose again. That was not the plan of God. That is certainly a nicer story, right? Because let's, you know, all the miracles and all the things that Jesus did, they would all still stand. But we've got this thing in the gospel about blood and about an innocent man being falsely accused and about horrendous suffering and shame. Romans crucified their citizens outside the city gate because they wanted everyone walking into the city to see the offender, to cause the greatest degree of humiliation to the offender who hung naked on a cross and to cause the greatest fear to the citizens of the city knowing that no one messes with Rome. That is part of the gospel story. And can I tell you, it is an indispensable part of the gospel story because through the suffering of Jesus, the price of the heinousness of your sin and my sin and the sin of every man, woman, and child who will call upon him before the time of the cross up until the time of his return, it is through his suffering and his death that we are saved. Because when Jesus suffered cruelly, when he suffered the innocent on behalf of the guilty, he took upon himself the punishment of God that was meant for you. Why is 
there an opportunity to be free from the punishment of hell? Because Jesus took that punishment for you. That's why the gospel needs to be preached. That's why the lost, and, and Paul talks about this in, in Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, that's why the lost, even if they have not heard, they still stand condemned because their sin has not been atoned for by a right payment, by the just payment, which is the cross of Christ. The second thing that we do and we say about hell is that we say, oh, I got behind here, sorry about that. I had all these cool slides, you missed them. All right, sorry about that. Um, I went to, I, I'm here to preach, not show slides, right, Randy? <laughs> the second thing we say is, let's improve their earthly suffering. This is real common today. Let's improve their earthly suffering. You know, in the early 20th century, we had something called the social gospel. Do you know why churches like North Ch I, I, I don't know all of your history but I know the history of Baptist and independent Bible churches. Do you know why they exist? Do you know why Lancaster Bible College and Karen University and Dallas Theological Seminary? Do you know why all these institutions came up in the early 20th century? It's because the denominations went after something called the social gospel. They didn't want to talk about hell. They didn't want to talk about Christ's suffering in his blood. And so they said, hey, let's just help people. And that's what they did. It was called the social gospel. If we help people, that will improve their lives. And so the denominations went full bore into helping people. But guess what they stopped doing? They stopped preaching the gospel. And folks, there is a lot of human suffering in this world. And as Christians, we, we ought to be and we are concerned about those needs. But if we help people with those needs and we don't share the gospel, we have only help to them temporarily. Amen. Today the issue isn't the social gospel, it's something called integral mission. Integral mission is saying, well, the gospel is both words and deeds. As part of that's true, but what we see happening is that we're going back to, in fact, it, what's happening today, it's the social justice gospel, not the social gospel. And if we address these issues of social justice, and there is injustice in our world, we, we know that. There is there is suffering, there's injustice, there's bad treatment, there's things that ought to change. But if we address those things without speaking the gospel and without addressing the heart need, we will only help people on a temporary basis. That's right. Christian missions has and uh, dramatically has changed the lives of people. Uh, we have missionaries doing, like I said, water and schools and education and all of, the, all of those things, but we cannot... And in fact, what those things do is they give us a platform to speak the gospel. We've got to share the gospel. The third thing that we say, and, and I think this is a little more common in, in our, in our uh, flavor of Christianity, uh, we say, well, you know what? Uh, the world is, is, is a messed up place. It's bad. It, it's going from bad to worse. Let's just hang on until Jesus comes. You know, Let's just hang on. So let's just hang in there. Uh, and... Um, I don't think God called us to hang in. I think God, God called us to press on and not hang on. That's right. right. So let's press on. Some say, well, let's reform society. Um, this is what we call dominionism or Christian reconstructionism. It's people that say, you know, we need to preach the gospel, uh, but what's going to happen is like communities are going to get saved, and, and you know, when, when you know, we preach to it and we see enough people get saved, we're going to kind of have this new Christian community and and uh, America is going to become this Christian nation. It's almost, by the way, there's an element of this in our founding fathers. A lot of them believe this. And um, it, it's, not, it's not the right belief. And, and certainly the gospel does bring a change, but it is, not our, it is not a reformed society that's going to bring about the change. Here's what I'm trying to say. Look, we can, we can make all of the political impact we want. And there's a lot of bad political stuff in our country today, right? Would you agree with that? You know, we're, we're kind of a mess. Politicians are a mess. Their lives are, are gross and disgusting, and, and we see all of these things. There's none of them that we really trust, but we could put all of our efforts into a better political solution. That will not solve the problem because the problem lies in our hearts. That's right. Amen. I'm not against getting involved politically. 
I, I think that's great. We should be a witness. We should, we should vote. We should do all of those things. We should know what's happening in our community. We should do all of that. But reforming our society will not change the hearts of people. Amen. It's got to be the gospel. The need to share the gospel, I'm reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. All these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Let me repeat that. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. How is the gospel going to get out to the world, the path and the way that God chose is that it is through us. And so I bring you to the last part of this, is that the world is perishing. What shall we do? Um, we should proclaim the gospel till Jesus comes. I do want to show you who these missionaries are. We need to proclaim the gospel till Jesus comes. We need men and women like Adoniram Judson. We need men and women like the pilot that I just talked to you about. Um, we need men and women like Johan and Haruko Strydon. This is a really cool couple. He's South African. She's Japanese. They met at Word of Life Bible Institute in Korea. They're back in Japan. And, and it's so cool. When they, they just finished candidate training in June. And they said to us, we're going we're gonna to plant a church in Osaka, Japan. And, and here's how we're going to do it. We, in, in Japan, in the Japanese culture, meeting in a house church is viewed as a cult. Because, you know, if you remember like, uh, like in Japan, the cults, there were, were like people following all kinds of things and... and um, very strange. So, so in Japan, because everything is so family-oriented, if you meet in a home and not in a church like a, a rented building, it's viewed as a cult. So he said, here's how we're going to start a church. We're going to just rent a place, and we're going to start doing like English classes, and we're just going to, we're just going to open. We're just going to have a church, and we're going to open, and we're going to invite people. And we, I, I got to tell you like how I thought, I was like, yeah, God bless you. That ain't going to work. <laughs> I was a little cynical, because I, I've been to Japan a number of times, and it's a less than one half of one percent of Japanese people follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's one of the most unevangelized. It's a modern country. It's beautiful. It's it's safe. It's you know it's, it's a lovely place, but very very few people. They went to Japan. This is their church. They did. God bless. Um, the, the slide on that side is, is a Christian church from Hawaii that came, and because they were Hawaiians, there's, there's a lot of like, connection between the Japanese and the... You go to Hawaii, and lots of Japanese people go to vacation in Hawaii. It's like us going to you know, the Bahamas or something, right? And uh, so this church came, and, and the people wanted Japanese, they wanted to come and meet the Hawaiians, you know? So the, they came, and they did the Hawaiian dance and all this stuff, and, and people came out, and they're having church. They know soccer in Japan Amen. just a few months after getting there. Praise the Lord. Or Jeff and Phoebe, who you're going to meet Jeff next week. I'll tell you what, Jeff is a bold brother. Just goes out in the street corner, opens his Bible, gets a, uh, a whiteboard, right, and, and just talks to people. He said, man, I couldn't do that. Yeah, that's tough, but can I tell you what happens? Yep, people smear and laugh and... But some people listen. Mm -hmm. And some have gotten saved and are growing. And so, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord and ourselves as your bond servants. When we share our faith, um, it's, it, it goes a lot against our upbringing. Because from the time we're little, we're, we're told that it's, it's not polite to force people to do things. It's not polite to ask for stuff. You know? 
Um, be respectful. You know, be, be considerate, right? We're, we're, and, and now we're, we're going to folks and we're, we're telling them a message that is going to turn their world upside down. That's a lot to ask. Would you, would you think that's a lot to ask? Basically, you know, everything you thought all your life is wrong because you've not known God, not known Jesus. Think about this. You're, we're talking to Roman Catholics. How many former Roman Catholics here this morning, right? And, and somebody shared the gospel. What was your first thought? What's wrong with me? I go to church. I was baptized. Who are you to tell me that everything I've grown up with and my father, and my grandfather, and his grandfather, and, and all of my friends, that, that they're all wrong, and my parents? Come on. I have a, my, my grandmother's husband, uh, my, kind of, you know, not my grandfather, but uh, came from Italy, uh, lived in the U.S. all his life, hardly could speak a word of English. I was a born a catechal, and I'm going to die a catechal. <laughs> yeah. um, or an atheist or somebody on a college campus wrapped in a pride flag or somebody whose worldview and by the way this is the vast majority of people in our country somebody whose worldview says anything goes do what you want to do be who you want to be Love who you want to love, right? And what what are we sharing? There's one God in heaven who sent His Son Jesus to be our to be your Savior. You're a sinner. That's hard. But you know, I want you to draw your attention to what Paul just said in that passage in Second Corinthians chapter four. We do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus. Amen. You are not asking someone to be like you. You are asking someone to be like Jesus. This is not about you, and it's not about me. And if God's calling you to go to a foreign mission field, you know what's happening to our missionaries in India? In two weeks, I'm going to be in India. I'm going to be with a missionary from Manipur, an Indian pastor from Manipur. I'm going to meet him in another place because I can't go to Manipur because they won't let me on the roads. There were ten. There are ten thousand Christians in Manipur who had to leave their homes. And in July, 150 pastors were killed in Manipur by the Hindus because they want a pure Hindu society. They don't want any of this Christian stuff. They don't want the Muslims either. But it is violent. It is awful. He has pastor friends who were killed. I hear about that too much, right? So we're going to Hindus and we're telling them. Vishnu is, is not peace. Nirvana is, is not going to happen. There's a man called Jesus in India. That's hard. But listen, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus for your sake. I'm completely out of time, but I just want you to, to draw to this one conclusion this morning. Why missions? And many of the reasons have been shared in the past couple of weeks, but I want to share one important part of that, this message is that because it is because the world is perishing. And that leaves us with two paths. Lots of decisions we make in our lives, lots of things we think about with church. But in, in this question, there are two paths for us to consider. And, and I think everyone should consider the first one. And it is this. God, have you called me to go? I think every believer needs to ask that question. God, have you called me to go? For many of us, the answer will, we haven't sensed that call in our life, and that is perfectly okay. God does not call us all to go, right? But we need to ask that and be willing. When we say, you know, I've laid my all on the altar, right? If you haven't laid that question on the altar, you're really not willing to, to follow Jesus anywhere. So, so we've got to ask that question. Lord, have you called me to go? And if the answer to that is no, if, if God does not burden your heart, then if he hasn't called you to go, he's called you to what? Give. Stay. Give. Send. 
Right? He's called us all to witness. Right? All of us. He hasn't called us all to be missionaries. And I, I'm using that word missionary in the sense of like going to another place. But he's called us all to witness. And he's called some of us to go. So if he's not called you to go, then just think with yourself, how, how are you doing on your part? The staying part, the sending part, the giving part, the praying part. I want to tell you, y'all need to be here Friday and Saturday. I know it's an extra time, but look, you're going to be sitting home watching some reruns of something stupid. <laughs> so, so come to church. Because your presence here is going to show these missionaries, wow, North Chester, man, on a Friday night, there's 75 people here. They, 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 you, want, you want to hug a missionary? Show up at a mission meeting. You want to, you want to love on a missionary? Show up at their meeting. You'll, you'll bless it. They'll, they'll leave barefoot. They'll, 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 they'll blow their socks off. You're, do, you're giving. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, call to go, call to send. One or the other. Let's do them both to the best of our ability for the glory of God. Father, we just want to thank you for your word because these things are hard for us. These ideas are, are challenging for us, Lord. Where we, we all can do better. We know that because we're human. We fail. We're finite, Lord. We, we, we totally understand that. Oh, but Father, help us to, 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 to love you with all of our heart, to, to, to pursue you above all other things in our lives. Uh, uh, more than our more than our passions, more than our desires, more than our plans, Lord, to put you first. And so from where we're seated, and, and I've gone way over this morning, so I don't want to, I just want to give a very simple invitation. If you're, if God is speaking to your heart to go, I, I, want, you, I want to give you just one simple response. Before the day is done, call Pastor Randy or Pastor Russ. If you believe in all, with all of your heart, that God is burdening your heart. You might just be a, a teenager, or, or maybe you're midlife, or maybe you're even in, in retired age, and, and whether it's short term or, or long term, if you believe God calling you to go, before the day is done, talk to one of your pastors. And the second invitation is for the rest of us. If God hasn't called you to go, He's called you to send. It means He's called you to send. And would you just pray a simple prayer like this, just quietly in your heart. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the reminder of this task. Of, uh, thank you for the reminder that the world is perishing. Lord, I've not been committed enough to this truth. I, I, I've, I've, I've allowed too many other things to crowd into my life. And, and Father, I just want to recommit my life to you today. I want you to make me a good sender. Father, I want you to help me evaluate my finances and my use of time. Father, I, I want you to lead me to how I can best serve right here at North Chester Baptist Church. And I want us all to close our prayer uh, in, in, in this way and allow me to lead the church together. Father, thank you for your love and grace and forgiveness. Thank you for your patience with us, Lord. We know we've blown it in so many ways. But Father, thank you that you, you look upon us like a father who just pities and, and loves his kids. And Father, thank you for loving us. Help us to be better kids today for you, to represent you well, to share the good news of the gospel, and to love you with all of our hearts until Jesus comes, in whose name we pray. Amen.